I'm Allison Hirsch. I'm the director of our master's program in landscape architecture and urbanism. And I'll be moderating this session, Planetary Warming, Technology and Resilience. Um, I have to admit, when I first was asked to moderate a session in the symposium on climate and technology through the lens of free market models, um, I was unfamiliar with the um, ideology of democratic capitalism, but I immediately thought of the climate activist and journalist Naomi Klein um, and her, her book, This Changes Everything, Capitalism Versus the Climate. And in that book, she lays the groundwork for what she conceives of as an incompatibility, um, as asking, is it to be capitalism and our extinction or the climate and our survival? And she asks, what do we value and how, how do we value it? And I'm just gonna do a brief quote uh, to set the tone. Um, she says, our economic system and our planetary system are now at war. So we are left with a stark choice, allow climate disruption to change everything about our world or change pretty much everything about our economy to avoid that fate. But we need to be very clear, of our decades of collective denial, no gradual incremental options are not available to us. Because underneath all of this is the real truth we have been avoiding. Climate change isn't an issue to add to the list of things to worry about next to healthcare and taxes. It is a civilizational wake-up call, a powerful message spoken in the languages of fires, floods, droughts, and extinction, and telling us that we need an entirely new economic model and a new way of sharing this planet, telling us that we need to evolve. And then she goes on to, to, to ask, so how do you change a worldview, an unquestioned ideology? And so. I'm certainly guilty of being one of those folks that thought um, the term democratic capitalism was actually an oxymoron. Um, but what I've been sort of seeing over the course of the day is uh, a set of economic models closer to another book that I've spent a lot of time with, Anna Singh's book, The Mushroom at the End of the World, on the possibility of life in capitalist ruins, where she studies what she calls capitalist edge effects or the markets at the margins of capitalist logic, specifically focused on, in her case, on the commodity chain of the Matsutake mushroom, um, which only grows in human disturbed forests. So an, an example of capitalism's ruins. And it can't be propagated, only foraged. And then she emphasizes there's no singular capital logic, but an incredible diversity within that system, which can be a source of environmental optimism. And I don't know, you know, I don't know if she's just clinging to some sense of hope or some desire for some form of hope rather than despair. But today, we're, we have four very diverse pers perspectives to add to this um, conversation on climate and technology and resilience. Um, the first is Andrea Chagut. She is a research scientist in finance and entrepreneurship leading MIT's real estate innovation lab. Kyle Konis, who's an architect and building scientist here at USC, focused on the environmental performance of buildings and most especially the experience of occupants within those buildings. And I'm happy to introduce a landscape architect into this conversation, the first that's being really heard from um, in what I think is a very appropriate uh, conversation to contribute to, uh, the art landscape architect Mia Lehrer, whose firm Studio MLA has had an immediate and sustained impact on the quality of the human and more than human um, habitats here in Los Angeles. And then finally, Sean Rickenbacker, an architect and data scientist who is director of the J. Max Bond Center for Urban Futures at CCNY. And he's most focused on, or the, the, the center is most focused on equitable models for urban development. So um, I'm gonna go back a little bit to the, the quotation I, I gave, and I'm, I'm sort of pitching the, the question that I'll probably come back to at the end is, are you actually operating at the margins or are these more inclusive models an edge effect? And can working within free market ideologies lead to the kind of change necessary for survival, or is this too incremental? And Naomi Klein asks, do you need a Marshall Plan for the Earth? So I think hopefully we'll, we'll start to understand if, if incrementalism is the way to go or if we need to rethink the entire system. Thanks. I'm a financial econometrician. I have a PhD in financial econometrics, which means that for most of my life, I've spent a lot of time in business and business analytics, particularly at the intersection of housing and commercial real estate. Great. Um, in this room, that's even in, it, it, that's, it, that's a special contrast, um, and I'm actually deeply, deeply grateful to be asked um, by Dean Curry and to be moderated by Allison. Um, and the reason being is because it's such an important conversation to have uh, between these different types of disciplines. When I showed up at MIT about eight years ago, um, most of my training had been in the rigorous measure 
and counting of the risk and return measures of commercial real estate, never without really considering, and, and I think back to this now with a great deal of embarrassment, but never with really without considering how the product was actually physically made. What was the energy and the work that ever went into that? And actually the idea that I would even go about thinking about it like this is even bizarre when I go back to my home institutions and speak to the Department of Finance and speak about these conversations. So I, I found it very interesting to be invited here, but also incredibly important and powerful um, to do so. So I'm, I'm very, very grateful. The fundamental thing about capitalism that, and I, that I was asked uh, to, to discuss today was that uh, it's a very abstract word, um, but it's based on real stories. Um, and finance is just as lost as you are. The, the whole industry is just as lost as you are, and they, but they've come up with a way, a mechanism, a set of tools and pedagogies to which they cling onto to make decisions. And those decisions are based on a series of mm, day-to-day -day narratives that they can create financial precedent or a story of experience. Um, and in finance, this story is not really a fiction um, or something with an unknown probability, which they call uncertainty, freaks them out. Um, no experiences to be measured is not something that we can engage in, which is in direct contrast to an entire discipline of architecture, which was, which was forced on a daily basis to invent new form, new idea, right? Think about all of the crits and design studios that we do to invent something new. You are inventors. And then you, you're, walked in, you're, you're asked to walk into a room with a bunch of financiers who would like you to tell you all of the stories where you've done this before and that they're okay. And actually for capitalists and finance, there is a need for nonfiction stories, genuinely nonfiction stories that can be probabilistically measured and turned into risk and return. Lots of experiences that we can count with measurable outcomes. So th this, is, this is the world in which they're operating when this is the pedagogy in which they've been trained. And that means that we have a little bit of a challenge. So design strategies that surround resiliency sustainability, health, and wellness are not put forth with financial evidence. Um, the vast majority of the projects that I've ever been called into, um, either in a professional capacity or at an advisory capacity at the EU level, at the United States government level, where they're like, let's get health and wellness and sustainability into affordable housing. And then you'll say, show me your, show me your pro forma. Show me your financial models in which you're going to do this. Show me your spreadsheet, death by spreadsheet. And what you find out is that the line items of all of the amazing work that you're doing to bring these strategies to bear to create this world is not even remotely measured or present. It's embedded in the square footage of the project and maybe in the fee of the architect if they count it. So data, details from stories, and this, these are like, these are even biased details of these stories that you're trying to produce have not been shared or collected in a systematic way about any of these strategies. And design pedagogy and process do not align with the pecuniary approach to measuring what architecture and urban design turns into the financial system, institutional and corporate real estate. So all of the beautiful things that we do turns into this asset class. And so finally, there's this limited measurement of sustainability of resiliency, of health uh, in buildings, let alone climate change, dealing with some of the greatest problems we will ever face as humanity. They're not even put forth. And so two domains, finance and design, are fundamentally at odds with one another, with good reason, but, society's de but fundamentally to society's detriment. We actually will really not be able to invent the future that we need or that finance or any policymaker really commands you to do because we don't actually include it in this thing called the spreadsheet. It's literally death by spreadsheet. So what we do at MIT's Real Estate Innovation Lab is we try to contribute the value of design strategies in institutional real estate asset pricing. So I went back and I said, I'm an econometrician, what can I do to, so to, to try to solve some of these problems? No, it's not solve, but help. How do I put the value of design? How do I put the value of resiliency? How do I put the value of sustainability on to the pro forma that changes 
this small developer's mind or this big institutional investor capital player's mind so that they have to do that on every single one of their projects. And so we try to identify features of design that contribute to better buildings. We try to identify features of sustainability, of health and wellness that, that contribute to better, better buildings and value them. Um, and we have several papers with these results that we try to, to document um, with our goal trying to bring these two domains that are seemingly at odds together. And so this is what fundamentally that we do in the lab. So if you want to learn more, you can head over to the lab. And we do this with a diverse group of humans. Um, I am very lucky to spend a great deal of time with computational architects, computational planners, and only a few financial econometricians. So we kind of hang out all together in this uh, uh, mixed bag of humans, um, which I'm really incredibly proud of. And so none of this work is, 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 the, is the lead directors alone. It's this entire team that does it. And we have lots of different pillars that we work on to do this. But some of our flagship projects that help us to try to understand some of these, these caveats um, potentially will hopefully contribute to creating measures of the built environment. So one of the projects is the MIT Technology Tracker, where we're trying to identify every invention of technology that the architects, devel developers, designers, planners, um, companies that are out there creating to make a better built environment. Um, you know, where is cross-laminated timber in all of this? Where is you know, 3D to assembled carbon fiber? Um, where is 4D printing? Where is fiber bots? Where are all of these technologies at in their deployment? And how could they help us uh, to resolve some of these challenges? We also try to engage in projects where we gather the information and the data around sustainability, resiliency, design, health, and wellness and put them into an asset pricing framework, into a financial framework where we count these stories and we say agnostically, for better or for worse, what happened? What happened in these stories? And, and try to catalog the best that we can to try to create a data narrative for each one of these. And then fundamentally turn that into financial metrics that um, these corporate and institutional real estate investors who own a great deal of capital throughout the world, what they do with them. So how do we actually put a line item on the spreadsheet? How do we change the game um, in that sense? And so we also fit, pay attention to this other sleeping giant. So climate change is probably one thing that gets me up in the middle of the night. I'd say the other thing is automation. It is a big structural change that is sleeping no more. It is growing every day, and it is transforming the way that we live, work, and play, and fundamentally will displace a great deal of communities. So that combined with climate change is something that actually keeps me literally up at night to say, how can we do better? And so I'll leave on these, these ideas of the spotlight on the value of design and the contribution of the work that you all do. Um, fundamentally, the value of sustainability has been proved through no less than 42 uh, commercial real estate papers and 36 residential housing papers, and some of them including affordable housing papers. Anybody who comes to you and says that I can't actually financially make sustainability happen, I would push back at them hard and say, why? It looks like you're going to make a ton of money. Every single one of these papers actually finds a premium in terms of real estate asset values relative to the non-treated you know, buildings that didn't get sustainability interventions and strategies of somewhere between 5 and 26%, depending on the market. And sustainability costs somewhere between 0% and 5.5% more. And this is based on numbers, counting the stories. I go out, I count stories, I use statistics and robustness checks to make sure that these stories are good. And so do all of my colleagues. So they're out there, the economists are out there, and they're literally, they're on your team. They're like, keep, keep doing the good fight of building good design because it's very valuable. So for this study in New York City, it's actually worth 21.6% more. And actually, the built environment has moved on. They're on to smart, connected, and green buildings. The value of daylight, the next time a developer or anyone tells you that you should not be paying attention or doing a daylight study and decreasing the health and wellness of the community, you should punch them in the face and say how much money you're going to lose over the next 100 years. And literally, they're going to lose somewhere between $5.50 and $6.50 per square foot of their asset for the next 100 years. That's expensive. 
Awarded design? Awarded designers are incredibly important. They know how to get projects through. For all the, the challenges that we have with them as institutions and as groups, we also learn a great deal about how they get projects through. And the value of those projects is astounding. Awarded architecture firms like SOM and Gensler, they actually trade at a premium in the marketplace. Wow. Norman Foster trades at a premium in the marketplace. It's because they get the projects off the ground. And then fundamentally, the geometric form really, really matters. Because you really sit there and you pay attention to the functionality of the structure. You really, when, when you're sitting there in crit, and I, I walk into architecture crit because I find it in, immensely amazing. When you walk into crit and people are paying attention to form, the long run consequences of the form are never ending. They change the 100 year value of structures, diagonality, curvature. We love curvy buildings as humans. We really do, and we really value it as well. So the next time we do not pay attention to these fundamental foundations in the architectural practice, we're actually doing ourselves a disservice. And then finally, what's happening inside. Workplace design is fundamentally important for human productivity and development. For those spaces that do not pay attention to workplace design, they fundamentally receive a 10% discount for every rent contract that they sign, which is equitable to about $7 per square foot. So again, I'm not paying attention to design. I'm not paying attention to daylight. I'm not paying attention to sustainability. I'm not paying attention to the health and well-being of my community members. If I'm not doing any of these strategies, I'm actually losing money. So it could be a slow Darwinian process, or it could be you could, you could do good. Who said that this morning? There was someone who said that. You have to do good, or you will not do well. And that's my point. And on that note, thank you. OK, uh, I'm Kyle Konis. I'm an assistant professor of architecture uh, here at USC. And I want to talk um, first about buildings. I think the, the theme uh, here, the keywords were resilience, technology, and um, a warming planet, I think. Uh, but I want to start with the word resilient. This is a project uh, many of you uh, probably recognize. You've been there yourselves. This is in Las Vegas. Um, and this is the city center project. This was built um, in the past decade and is one of the largest uh, sustainable development projects in the United States. It's one of the largest LEED certified projects. And in fact, uh, six of the buildings uh, that you see here uh, received a LEED gold rating. So LEED is the, uh, one of the uh, green building labeling systems that we use in the United States to um, differentiate what we claim to be sustainable architecture from business as usual practices. Um, you'll see the work of uh, star architects from around the world who've convened here to build, um, to do essentially what they've been trained and elevated to do, which is to make iconic works of architecture. Um, these are buildings that could really be anywhere in the world. Um, and and uh, this is a project where um, all of these buildings are sealed. And uh, because of the climate in Las Vegas, these buildings need to be constantly refrigerated so that they can be occupied. And the reason I'm sort of starting with this today is that we have um, uh, today in California, and particularly in Southern California, uh, if we were doing this uh, workshop at San Bernardino State University, if you go on their website today, San Bernardino State uh, University is closed today. It's closed today because uh, the utility company, Southern California Edison, has uh, voluntarily shut the electricity off. Uh, the reason that they did that is to avoid uh, potentially starting wildfires. And that's important uh, because Southern California Edison is a publicly traded utility company. They pay a pretty good dividend. I think it's about 5%. Um, that money is essentially money that um, ratepayers are funding that's going to uh, investors in that stock that could potentially have been gone to um, maintain the power lines and avoid the kinds of, of risks that we're incurring now. So we're, we talked about being fortunate today. Uh, one of the reasons we're fortunate uh, here is because we have 
the supply of electricity. Imagine if uh, electricity was shut off, uh, as it is here today in California to uh, over 300,000 customers, I think was the projection. So that's potentially over a million people in California with no electricity. Uh, what does that mean for resilience? What does that mean uh, if we wanted to determine an asset rating for these buildings where we had to assume that there would be periods where they didn't have uh, regular supply of electricity? These buildings would need to be evacuated. Um, and that's something I think we're going to be starting to think about as we start to redefine what architects do, uh, what's within the architect's standard of care, can we really claim that building sealed and refrigerated buildings in the desert is at any point uh, in the future or now within our standard of care? And these are our celebrity, these are our most celebrated architects. We just heard Norman Foster and Gensler um, held out as exemplar designers. Those architects came to Las Vegas, they did those projects. They probably raised questions about, you know, is this a responsible thing to be doing? And uh, they maybe had a lack of agency in that process, or they just decided to keep doing it. Um, but interestingly, if, if we're curious where our electricity is coming from today, uh, this is one of the power plants that LADWP built uh, back in the 1980s. This is the Intermountain uh, Coal Power Plant in Utah. This was built on uh, land that at one point belonged to the Ute uh, Indians. This was Native American land that was about 160 years ago, uh, taken through something called an executive order, um, which is a legal way, I guess, of taking land. Uh, this power plant was built to supply electricity to Southern California. And just in terms of a number, because I'm going to talk about um, numbers later in the presentation with California's cap and trade program, uh, this cost about $4.5 billion to build uh, back in the 1980s. Um, and this is what's supplying our electricity today. So uh, if we just take a break and we look around the room, we can see we're using electric uh, lighting during the daytime. We have an abundance of sun here in Southern California. And we've come up with the idea that we're going to create an enclosure and use electricity to make light. We have a sealed, actually not a sealed room, but a refrigerated space here, I think, Part of the reason I'm walking is to make myself more comfortable. Uh, so we have a huge discrepancy between indoor and outdoor temperature that we're forcing on ourselves. Um, we're building designers, right? We should be thinking about this. This is literally affecting our bodies as we're sitting here congratulating ourselves on our activism today. <laughs> uh, okay, so technology. Uh, in. Uh, the context of democratic capitalism, I think it's interesting to think about what engineers do and what uh, technology is, because we use these words all the time. We celebrate uh, the contribution of engineers, and we, um, we know that engineers solve problems. Uh, they come up with solutions to things, right? So we're going to come up with a solution to global warming. We're going to come up with uh, solutions to technical challenges. And so air conditioning, because that's part of the theme today, is uh, a technical solution to the production of paper, to, to pr the process of printing on reams of paper. In humid environments, that was a problem. Willis Carrier invented a technology that would blow air over tubes filled with cold water, and that would um, chill the air down and re reduce the humidity. It turned out that that was a great uh, product that could be sold uh, as room air conditioners for residential use. And this is a slide from the 1939 World's Fair in New York, where uh, the Carrier Corporation at that point had to come up with a creative and innovative way to convince people that they needed this new technology. And so this is when uh, air conditioning as a consumer product was born, uh, but also when people became unknowingly passive consumers of a new kind of indoor climate. Uh, so, democracy and capitalism. This is a 10K form. This is something, uh, free market capitalism is still heavily regulated. Uh, publicly traded companies have to disclose uh, information about their corporate practices. 
You can find that online. You can read it. Uh, so what is Carrier Corporation up to today? It's not 1939. It's 2019. Uh, so I was reading through the 10K form on the internet, and one of the interesting things about the application of air conditioning uh, in terms of, of uh, our context is that it, here in California, we're moving away from compressor-based cooling technologies. We're actually funding ratepayer-sponsored research in California to move away from this technology. We know this is not uh, environmentally sustainable. Um, UTC, which owns the Carrier Corporation, is uh, rapidly trying to uh, market and um, sell this technology in the developing world. So if we look at uh, how this is being applied, obviously there's a residential market, but if we look at uh, buildings, if we look at sort of building design in the commercial sense, uh, here's a building in San Jose, California. This meets code in San Jose, California. It's a sealed glass building. Imagine what would happen if we started to um, export this type of building design to the regions of the world, the cities in the world that are experiencing the majority of growth in the 21st century. This is the, uh, the implication of, one, adhering to this technology, uh, but to understand that this is also coupled uh, with a kind of conventional attitude towards uh, building design that we are also exporting. Uh, and beyond that, the part that I want to talk about today, if I haven't used up all my time, is the standard. And this, I just found the laser pointer here. Uh, that we are also exporting the standardization of indoor climate uh, to the rest of the world uh, on top of any kind of um, diversity or expectation in, in sort of uh, indoor environmental conditions. Uh, just to put this in context here in California, uh, why this matters to architects and why this is important. This is the demand curve for electricity use in California. So it varies by time of day. And buildings, building envelopes and the demand for air conditioning to support them is what drives our peak demand. So for, if we care about environmental justice, if we care about the pollution that comes from these sources of emissions, uh, the worst, dirtiest power plants are the ones that we turn on here in California to meet this peak demand. Uh, so building designers, the decisions that architects make, have a huge impact on uh, the environmental pollutants that are associated with our, our resource use. Uh, so this is kind of the thesis of my talk. It's important, and so I wrote it on the slide so you can look at it. The idea is that uh, pedagogically, we want to shift from the production of singular and iconic works of architecture to systems and processes for realizing uh, design potential in all buildings. And part of this is to realize that uh, it's not about making new things. The built environment is already here, so we need to be observing it, talking about it, and understanding how to um, modify and adjust it. Uh, so I think this requires three shifts. It's very briefly uh, shifting away from theory or assumptions. In many cases, uh, these come from thermal comfort chamber experiments. <laughs> Sorry, going back. Uh, from Northern Europe uh, from almost a century ago. Uh, we're now publishing this in the form of standards and convincing people that they need to buy equipment and install that in buildings to, to meet these standards. Uh, we need to do research, and I think in architecture schools, uh, this kind of research is critical to actually do the work in situ, uh, in real buildings, to actually validate or question those assumptions, learn from them, and, and sort of think through it. Uh, some of the work I've been involved in is sort of uh, global in the sense that researchers are starting to pool data from studies to define actual data-driven models that come from real buildings so that we can hold out buildings that might uh, serve as alternative models that we might want to uh, promote or refine. Second is a shift from component-based to performance-based ways of thinking about buildings. So thinking about buildings as systems rather than just collections of parts, where each part is important to uh, talk about in isolation. Uh, this would also involve a new set of metrics that uh, shift away from uh, improvements in efficiency to looking at autonomy. And then finally, from uh, steady state indoor environments 
uh, to climate-based indoor environments, or indoor environments that are actually drift in response to daily or seasonal changes in outdoor temperatures. Uh, so this room is a great example of a kind of sealed, steady state indoor climate. It makes no sense. Uh, it's tightly controlled. It will be the same uh, in winter as it is in summer. Uh, there's no relationship or um, interface to the users of this room. And so we've become these kinds of passive consumers uh, to this condition. Uh, when we do research, we actually find uh, data from real buildings that show that buildings should be controlling indoor environments, but they should be doing them in a way that's sensitive to climate and that enables end users to have some form of participation. So I don't know if I'm going over time. I haven't actually been keeping track. It's been 13 minutes. OK, so not, not too bad. <laughs> OK, so the work that I do, um, the part that I'll talk about today is in participatory sensing. Uh, so the state of California is actually doing a lot of things right in the sense that uh, we have passed Assembly Bill 32, which is to reduce our carbon emissions by 80% uh, statewide from 1990 levels. We have a cap and trade program where we capture and actually um, put a cost on carbon and use that uh, to uh, support uh, investments in impacted communities. Uh, but California also has a history of ratepayer funded research projects. And so this is one of the projects. Uh, it was funded by the California Energy Commission, uh, which looks at ways of doing research and development in the built environment to um, keep California's per capita electricity use flat. Uh, so if we compare this to uh, business as usual in the US, we actually see that while it, California's economy has kept growing, uh, we've decoupled the economy and economic growth from uh, consumption. And I think this is a really important understanding uh, to dispel the myth that somehow being sustainable or being more efficient means suffering, that we have to sort of give something up. In reality, all we need to do is stop wasting things, right? We can observe today we're, we're just wasting things here in this room by chilling it down, right? We're wasting things uh, by using electric lighting during daylight hours. There's no real um, benefit to us. There's no suffering uh, that will happen by just uh, reducing or, or eliminating that waste. Um, so California is a actually a success story in terms of decoupling economic growth from resource consumption, at least in terms of electricity use. Um, on the topic of making buildings smart, uh, we have a lot of interest now in automation. I think, Andrea, you can rest uh, at ease because uh, buildings are not going to be getting smart anytime soon. I think the automation in buildings will struggle because the business models of the companies that develop the technologies that go into buildings, um, those businesses are not uh, collaborating, working together in a way that's going to enable uh, these, uh, build, at least from an energy perspective, uh, to function in an efficient way. Uh, the goal typically in buildings is to make uh, sort of the buildings increasingly more sophisticated in their ability to um, surveil occupants and to execute sort of closed loop control of technical systems that remove people from the loop of uh, building sort of interaction. Uh, the, the interest uh, that I've developed more recently is to use sort of ubiquitous computing as a means of sort of repurposing this new um, sort of indoor location technology to give uh, staff, students, uh, faculty and other sort of campus users the ability to actually uh, have a thermostat inside of rooms. So taking today as an example, if we were to look around, we might find a thermostat in this room. It's not functional. Uh, we created a way where we could uh, spatially map uh, rooms and buildings and give people the ability to essentially vote, a kind of uh, subjective survey of indoor temperatures. And we started to look at this data in a pilot study uh, to understand what the thermal preferences were of the campus community. So it was a kind of a participatory approach. And one of the findings was uh, routinely, um, indoor temperature gave no predictive 
um, it was sort of not valid as a predictor for subjective outcomes. Uh, but the relationship between indoor and outdoor temperature was actually very powerful. So we found that uh, just by simply understanding the discrepancy between indoor and outdoor, people were always telling us they wanted the spaces to operate with some awareness of daily and seasonal temperature changes. Uh, so instead of making the building smarter, we're trying to figure out how do you scale this up and actually make the thought process or the thinking of the institution, how does that change? Uh, so to wrap up here, um, going from buildings to systems, why do that? California has set this really ambitious goal. It's actually on track. Uh, we have five billion square feet of existing commercial. Uh, if we wanted to retrofit that, there's a goal of a 40% uh, reduction target. That would be uh, deep energy retrofits to about 330 million square feet each year. And that, if we want to look at it, is about 55 of USC campuses per year. So that's a vast amount of building that we need to touch. And so as architects, we have to be thinking at a larger scale than we're used to. We're also doing this on top of a space that has history. So this is uh, the Cal Enviro screen. This was a tool that was developed to identify where the investments from California's cap and trade program should go, where the money that's being sort of taken from polluter should be spent. Uh, and it was used to map areas that were both impacted by pollution, but also the most vulnerable to pollution. So you can sort of look at the methodology for that. Uh, but if you look underneath, this is, I think Scott this morning talked about redlining. This is the, essentially the maps, uh, the homeowners loan corporation maps that were developed to direct investments in the 1930s for communities in, in Los Angeles. And strangely, they used a sort of similar color scheme. So you can look and see how closely this maps to the current environmental um, sort of pollutant risk and vulnerabilities. Uh, so that's also design. That's not sort of just, uh, it just sort of happened that way. There's a sort of cascading set of decisions that went into uh, where investment was placed, but then also where particular land uses were zoned and allowed and where people were restricted to live. Uh, so this wasn't invented in the sense in the 1930s. This is just a sort of depiction of the kinds of bias that was sort of at play in the real estate market. And I think we can observe this today in Los Angeles. So where did the data come from to draw these maps? Scott, are you still here? Where did the data come from? You mentioned that this came from data. Right, the data. From the industry, yeah. This was, they, they just asked realtors. Um, and I'm, first of all, I'm not an expert. My expertise is not in um, the history of Los Angeles and redlining. So I'm going off of an uh, article I read on the internet, which is always risky for your presentation. Uh, but I think that the data came from asking the realtors to just sort of subjectively uh, assess what they thought were neighborhoods where there should be sort of high risk versus low risk. And so they just went with their own racial bias. Uh, and, and so in a way, these are just maps of, of bias. They're just sort of visualizations of what that looks like. And I think it's useful to think about what, what, would, we, what would our maps look like if we were to draw the sort of bias that we have today. We're still doing redlining, right? We're still doing it in, in different ways. So, I guess the reason that's there is to show that when, when we look at this kind of scale uh, in terms of the kind of modifications of the built environment, we're not just sort of targeting these carbon reduction goals, planetary warming, right? We're not just trying to stabilize atmospheric CO2 emissions. We're trying to, or we should be thoughtful about undoing some of the, um, I don't think we can be anti colonialists at this time, I think we can start to try and undo uh, some of the disparities that, uh, that we see in terms of environmental risk. And California, in a way, uh, provides a lot of models that are sort of successful examples of, of political action. So the um, uh, uh, decarbonizing our energy supply, that was actually supported by Senator Kevin DeLeon. I'm a proud immigrant. Um, 
but a, and I've been in California for four decades. Um, I must say that I'm a little bummed out this afternoon from the conversations on many levels. I mean, obviously, um, having grown up in a in a in a third world at the time, although I think we're reaching that point here too. Uh, we, I had never experienced this much poverty as I, I am experiencing now. And the fact that we're focusing on shelter, that, that given my sort of métier, my, mich, my sort of uh, education is um, around the interstitial spaces and not on buildings, um, and it's about um, you know, basically the environment and the landscape that makes cities. Um, you know, I, be, we're being confronted with the notion that uh, uh, basically parks, open space, and even though they seem to have value, thank you, Kevin and others, um, certainly in this afternoon's conversations or today's conversations, um, it hardly came up. It was all about, um, a lot about sort of buildings and, and the urban form. So a lot of, a little bit, a lot of pressure. Uh, <laughs> um, and thank you um, for bringing uh, Naomi Klein up. Um, the la a couple years ago, we spent quality time with um, Naomi uh, in this room, actually. And um, it happens to also be in a, in a really uh, a sort of important decade for landscape architecture. Um, Ian McCarg and a group out of Penn wrote um, the Declaration, uh, the Environment, and uh, sort of uh, and the group of uh, us from the Landscape Architecture Foundation. Um, updated it in the last year and uh, really, uh, I think, brought to bear the notion that we have the right, um, obviously, to, to a, a, a world that is uh, resilient and uh, that we do have to focus on the environment. And it's not an if, but it's a tipping point now and we have to do something. So for those of us who are parents and grandparents, it all comes to bear in, a, in an important place. And um, you, you know, we've been stretched to the limits and clearly we're, urban populations are growing dramatically. And um, when we, it, I really have appreciated um, Dean Curry sort of framing these conversations about democratic capitalism and I, I've, learned a lot in terms of um, social impact and good developers and um, developers who are incredibly selfish and egotistical um, and uh, how we can make change um, in our cities, both as citizens, as professionals, and um, that, you know, hopefully, uh, We'll, we'll get beyond sort of this incredible impact, uh, impasse that we're in. Um, landscape architecture actually produced um, a, a lot of metrics over time, including the, all the processes, uh, GIS and many others. So I think we need to claim that. Um, and it was uh, a Californian out of Esri who actually put forward some really an amazing company that, that has done, has given us a lot of, uh, a lot of, given us the technology to able to basically measure, um, measure success um, and also impact. So um, as landscape architects, we believe that in order to, for projects to be truly resilient, socially, economically, and environmentally, they most, must be both multi-beneficial and regenerative. This means processes that restore, renew, and revitalize their own sources of energy and materials in addition to addressing multi-beneficial thinking to create equitable systems that integrate the needs of society with the integrity of nature. 
We need to leverage multi-beneficial planning and regenerative design to manage stormwater, provide flood attenuation, improve access to recreation and nature, increase, increase habitat, decrease the urban heat island effect, transform transportation systems, increase density, ensure the security of our resources, namely food, energy, water, air, all while promoting the celebration of culture and connecting communities. No big deal, right? Here is a breakdown of how we might think about it, and I'll be sharing eight projects very briefly. Water, we need to enhance flood storage, improve water quality, and enable safe access to water um, to the river, for example, in LA. In LA, we need to restore ecosystems, increase biodiversity, and increase tree canopy uh, for all the reasons that have been talked about um, in, in the last couple conversations uh, associated with air, air quality, heat island effect. Culture and education. We need, we need to you know, really understand the value of uh, celebrating our culture and to provide more links to uh, cultural destinational, uh, destinations and educational facilities. Food and agriculture. Um, did you know that California is um, the, produ the produces 50% of the food um, for the whole country? And along with it, of course, comes a tremendous uh, sort of uh, cost to our, our uh, power and water usage. So we need to decrease the food shed footprint, increasing access to healthy food, increase urban agriculture, implement biodiverse <laughs> farming practices. And then energy. Um, I think uh, in LA, we really need to support the energy water nexus. Uh, we spend about 70% of our energy moving water around, thousands of miles. And of course, that has an impact on um, air and air quality and many other things. Um, weaving communities. Um, in, in looking at some of the, the mapping that has been done in terms of uh, redlining, you realize that LA was really sort of uh, segregated, and um, you know the, it's been decades of segregation um, that we needing to sort of get out of and become more inclusive. Open space and recreation clearly um, we don't it's not equitably equitably distributed. We happen to be studying now about 200 miles. Thank you for AB 266. We happen to be studying about 200 miles of um, of base tributaries because you know the the river is only 51 miles, um, and any everybody only studied the stem, so they forgot basically the tributaries and um, somebody woke up and said, let's do that. Lots of communities will get impacted or, or benefited. We need to identify commercial opportunities that are equitable and don't displace people. We've talked about that quite a bit. Um, identity, the whole notion of fostering civic pride and engaging res residents in the process um, to celebrate neighborhoods and our cultural heritage. I mean, when people talk about how we have to engage the community, I mean, I, I don't know how to operate otherwise. They are my source of inspiration. I have spun off three nonprofits. One of them is having their fundraiser tonight, in case you want to participate. L.A. Moss, USC graduate. Um, and, we, and, so, and then we have to recognize that cities must b base growth and in integrating natural systems into the urban framework. And finally, as global citizens, so it's not just community participation in our communities, we must exercise our rights to advocate for the proper planning. Uh, our voices and creative abilities as designers have tremendous value, and we need to be able to um, educate our elected officials, help create policy, and uh, therefore become uh, sort of uh, par participants in sort of this larger picture. So this happens to be an old rail yard potentially being turned into a uh, you know a new 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 hub in the city that also attenuates water across from Union Station and right next to the new USC Medical Center. Um, across the way, three acres 
small site, three acres of asphalt being turned into an urban ecological laboratory at the Natural History Museum, a project we did about seven years ago, which has created an incredible community of um, iNaturalists and uh, other engaged uh, young people who actually love to understand, who have learned to understand the value of um, of nature and and being able to celebrate it and uh, and uh, understand it better. Um, and then, you know, right across the street from it and a uh, culturally interesting facility that has a lot to do with USC and that's the Lucas Museum of, Nat Nat uh, Nat uh, of Narrative Art that sits on 12 acres of parkland that actually celebrates the California transect. And so it's as a biome, it becomes a celebration of the Mediterranean biome that has a very close uh, relationship to seven other uh, centers in southern areas of the world. And therefore, you know, as a global message, it becomes really important. And then food and food and agriculture. We've been working on the Food Policy Council. LA was the first city in the in the country to have a, a, a food policy council, and now there are twenty. Um, and then energy. This ha this is a small park that's going to be built across from City Hall, where the shade structures also collect, obviously. Um, a, sun and solar power, and this is a, a, a closed loop system where we're actually also growing food and growing the first stand of large oak trees in the middle of the city. Um, and then connectivity. As we start building in the industrial areas around the river, we start looking at de-armoring the river and integrating it into the city and starting to sort of really understand how we connect east and west, north and south, um, and also uh, buildings with m m many hundreds of units of housing, but also uh, in uh, art and education opportunities, retail and uh, other uh, sort of uh, types of uses. And then um, a stadium um, that is going to be, uh, that is in construction where there's about 10,000 jobs um, being created um, a, a stadium that's going to be used 200 days out of the year, and not just 20, part of the community, part of a retail and also residential community, and where water is actually being used to, uh, in a closed loop system, to actually condition uh, some of the buildings, but also being used for irrigation. Destination Crenshaw, probably in terms of my lifetime, or my life in working in communities, a very Emotionally charged project, two linear miles um, along Crenshaw Boulevard, uh, where a new uh, sort of linear park is being created with a series of art pieces and uh, a new sort of urban uh, sort of art for forest and uh, alternative mode of transportation with bikeways and pedestrians and adjacent to the new rail line going to the airport. Um, Along the river at the 100-acre site um, at Taylor Yard and up, you know, this, the kind of sort of integration of uh, both uh, park space access to, to uh, recreation, a better understanding of how the systems come together and an integration of about five communities that, ne that never had a bridge to br be bridged together. And, um, Small projects, big projects, um, and uh, always working sort of to try to build community in the fifth largest economy in the country. Um, only a region, a part of a, a very important, obviously a very important region, and uh, it's always uh, really interesting to be able to get gain a perspective from those of you who come from other parts of the country because um, we do get very, very focused on uh, what, you know, the little accomplishments that we are reaching here, albeit we are in, a, in, a, in, a, in the state of California, which uh, obviously environmentally is um, sort of a, a leader in terms of policy 
and the you know the founder of uh, climate change from of uh, carbon credits um, is one of our friends and someone who is actually um, really engaged in many of the the legislation um, at the state level and has uh, sort of imparted in, uh, with with to us a real sense of um, obligation towards the greater community and the greater whole. And thank you, Mary Nichols, um, for uh, having been one of the ones who actually helped uh, Im helped imagine and helped create the carbon um, the carbon credit uh, program in California. Thank you. Good afternoon. We, we we've made it. <laughs> Almost. <laughs> Almost. Um, this will, this will be painless, but I, I will um, make a few comments uh, about my ignorance and perhaps lack of confidence, not only in myself, but in the profession to address some of the issues, particularly of this uh, session with regards to um, climate change, uh, resilience. Um, some people in the room might be familiar with the philosopher Timothy Morton. Um, and he has a, uh, a term that he introduced called hyperobjects. And these hyperobjects are things that we simply um, are unfamiliar with that keep emerging in familiar contexts. And, and I use that because uh, I find myself um, in my practice where I'm the uh, director of the J. Max Bond Center for Urban Futures in New York City. Uh, we are charged with being the applied research center that is the interface between um, government, uh, communities, the civic realm, industry, and academia. Uh, and, and the premise is that you need all four of those groups to really drive meaningful innovation. And, and now getting back to the, uh, the term hyperobject, um, some of the things that we've been charged with, particularly around more equitable uh, design and development opportunities uh, within an environment that is certainly under threat uh, based on how we are using our resources, energy, climate change, et cetera, really produces a very perplexing world. Um, so uh, nothing that I'm going to present to you has uh, definitive answers, but uh, as a center, we are engaged uh, in the School of Architecture, um, but we have uh, contra contractual agreements with faculty in computer science, uh, economics, uh, social sciences. Um, we're trying to bring in some philosophers. So we are trying to work broadly uh, in constructing uh, both an analysis and a direction of where uh, we think urban futures might actually lead us. So um, the the title that I've produced for this session is Increased Urban Density as Climate Mitigation, which I think uh, you've probably all heard of before. It was already mentioned that uh, the city of Minneapolis has completely rezoned the entire city. Uh, and part of that is an effort to, uh, at scale, address climate change uh, by increasing density, which will uh, uh, preserve resources uh, throughout the city uh, as one of the ideals. And the second part, uh, radical rezoning in search of new territory. Uh, I'm gonna take you on a um, experimental research project that we're conducting for a community board in New York City. It's community board nine. Uh, the uh, island of Manhattan and all of the boroughs uh, have these geographic territories uh, that range in size. They're quite large in terms of their populace. And each one of them has a community board um, and also has a political representative on city council who votes, and this is where it becomes important, on rezoning. So if you've read the news at all, as of late, uh, Mayor de Blasio and former Mayor Michael Bloomberg have rezoned uh, massive territories in New York City. Uh, and there are, these are very contested territories in terms of who's going to benefit. I thought, I'd, uh, this, I thought this would be mentioned throughout the day um, perhaps is worth revisiting uh, as a reminder. Um, but with regards to housing, and I'm going to speak not so much about ownership, but the rental market in particular, um, this graphic shows you that since 1960, rents have dramatically outpaced wage growth, uh, leading to more uh, cost-burdened household, households. 
And that is, from where I stand and from where I believe you sit, uh, is a very challenging problem for architects to wrap their head around about how do we manage and deal with this reality. So uh, there is a group, I, I, it, I heard it mentioned earlier today, uh, quite often, uh, not-for-profit developers. But there's also this mid-tier developer, uh, I believe they operate here in California as well, but certainly in New York, uh, affordable housing market developers. Uh, there are some, um, some developers with very successful uh, track records. Jonathan Rose, so for some of you might know the name, uh, Throughout the country, his, his uh, uh, company has projects throughout the country, is really sought after by some progressive cities as a preferred developer for affordable housing. So in, in short, he's made the numbers work. But what I want to point to here is the, um, the challenge. Land costs and restrictive zoning are two of the key impediments to the construction of affordable housing uh, in high demand urban markets. Um, so in some sense, this graphic on the, uh, on the left here uh, also points out uh, some of the challenges with regards to undeveloped and overdeveloped land on the island of Manhattan. And if you follow the graph there, um, the underdeveloped, it seems to be in lower Manhattan. And, and this is, again, artificial scarcity, right? This is because of zoning. Uh, and this is another thing that's sort of been pervasive uh, in the kind of underlying commentary about uh, what we're challenged with today, but zoning is definitely one of those, uh, one of those challenges. So uh, why did lion prices grow so fast after 1977? Uh, Cushman and Wakefield's Bob uh, Kankel uh, chalked it up to one thing, uh, that being zoning. When zoning came in, all of a sudden you had restrictions on use and restrictions on bulk. What that led to was scarcity, he said, that combination of scarcity and location drove up land value. So we, we have a number of colleagues here who are uh, doing great work in trying to uh, help us and help the world sort of understand uh, how land values are um, calculated. And so, uh, and to what extent uh, that can help inform us on the possibility uh, of where we, uh, where and how we use that information. Uh, we'll also note that about 60% of all residential properties are zoned with a ratio of one. I think everyone in this room uh, might be familiar with um, uh, FARs. And um, in this case, what it, in other words, most of the city is reserved for one or two family homes. California, uh, Los Angeles being a very good example. Currently, more than 90% of residential structures in New York City are three floors or lower. Uh, people often seem surprised when they uh, learn of that. Um, Queens, in the borough of Queens, that number is 98%. Conversely, apartment buildings of 20 stories or more account for a mere 0.15% uh, of all residential buildings. And the city is decidedly uh, low rise and is legally mandated to be so. And I'm speaking more, again, specifically of New York City. So New York is going uh, to have difficulty remaining a thriving and growing city if it uh, maintains uh, such limits. So some of you may recognize these. How many people know what these are called? Super tall. Skyscrapers. That might be the old term. Anybody else? Super tall. All right. It's on there. It's cheap. You can read it. So um, the super tall is, a, is an interesting model for us to examine uh, through the Bond Center. Um, you can read it there. Price of the land per square foot uh, combined with generous zoning regulations uh, in central and lower Manhattan produces very favorable uh, return on investment models. Um, this, I'd like to point out, is not the innovation of architecture. This is the innovation of a real estate and financial market. Although its physical form is new and we may seek to take uh, credit for this new, what is often referred to as accidental skyline, uh, I choose to believe that the ROI suggests other, that these were not so accidental. Uh, again, it's a highly efficient uh, financial model that drove the uh, emergence of these towers in Manhattan. So uh, if I may, um, 
just to give you a bit more information regarding these. Um, so how do they get built? Again, not so much the design of architects uh, per se, without the mandate and the uh, directives from their clients. Uh, air right transfers and zoning lot mergers are two of the primary mechanisms by which developers build significantly larger buildings and avoid the scrutiny of the city's public review process. So this is legal within the zoning. I go back, maybe there's, so, maybe there's something within zoning that we might need to take a closer look at. So um, very promising uh, work here by uh, see if I can, Richard Barr, oh, Jay, I'm sorry, Jason Barr. Uh, Jason decided that he would take a look at uh, the ROI and ROE analysis of some of these super talls. And so for those of us who actually like numbers, I'm, I'm one of those people, um, really, really fascinating. And highly profitable, no question about it. Regardless of the enormous investment that goes into these up front, the returns warrant them, and therefore the model is being fully adopted and rolled out at neck-breaking speeds, transforming entire landscapes of Manhattan, which is a place that I guess I can call home. I grew up in the Bronx. I've been there for the majority of my life, and I could have never even trained as an architect to imagine that at some point we would arrive at these super talls. And to imagine what's next uh, is an interesting proposition, I think, for both those in academia, the industry. Um, this caught politicians and civic leaders off guard. Right? That tells you something about the rules and regulations around zoning that is in place to be exploited in a manner that is not perhaps equitable across all parts of the city. So go on here. So here's another interesting uh, analysis. This is called the uh, skyscraper profit index. And so from 1963 onward, you can see the trajectory of how building taller provided more profitability. It, it makes sense, particularly in such scarcity of land in the place like Manhattan. So it should be no, it comes as no surprise that there's clearly a correlation between density, heights, land value, profitability, the question again, how do you gain or create more equity in this particular type of market? So uh, tax exempt housing bonds. Someone mentioned earlier how challenging it is for not for profits as well as uh, affordable developers to get in line uh, for federal tax subsidies and credits that actually make their projects possible. Uh, many uh, not-for-profits and affordable developers during these periods where they're waiting to find out whether they'll be funded often sell their properties. They uh, enter into mergers uh, and, and uh, not necessarily public-private relationships but partnering relationships with other developers to mitigate some of the costs in carrying the land until they're able to develop it. So one of the interesting things about this information here is that public investment in housing when access has proven to provide big results economically and socially. Um, so the question is, uh, could this improve further uh, if there were more interest from the private market? market? Could there be more interest um, that is generated in the private market to engage this type of development uh, based on perhaps a new uh, model that they might um, deem profitable? So with respect to uh, climate, and resiliency, um, this is one of those kind of hyper, uh, hyper objects uh, referred to again by, by Timothy Morton. This is uh, New York uh, during these periods, 2015, 2020, 2080, and 2100. And the uh, devastation and loss, you can see the numbers tallied down there, uh, which are the expected uh, loss in units. Uh, that might occur uh, if we continue along the path that we are on. So another question that we're raising is where, in terms of new territories, do we build to not only house those who are continuing to densify cities, but those who will be displaced because of environmental uh, conditions? The information here uh, talks about some of the cities. Um, 
objectives and their plans around uh, climate change and how to offset and or mitigate those. Um, and it also uh, services, um, well, the cities believe that they're servicing climate mitigation in this way. There's a correlation between increased density, as I mentioned, so uh, Minneapolis has understood that, transportation reduction, the possibility of reinvestment in cutting building emissions, so we heard about some of the technological uh, goals that architecture can uh, start to move towards. But to reach New York City's 80 by 50, that's an 80% reduction in emissions by 2050, uh, unprecedented levels of investment would be needed to improve the efficiency of building envelopes, mechanical systems, lighting and appliances, uh, while also continuing strides towards the uh, use of lower carbon fuels. Uh, more than 85% of the measures evaluated could yield cost savings that would outweigh upfront costs and create a net economic benefit to society. Uh, but innumerable barriers would need to be overcome first. Um, I think what's being intimated by those innumerable uh, 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 barriers uh, is in fact cost. So one of the things that we've been doing at the center is actually trying to democratize data. So a lot of what we do is assemble and collect data, particularly from public sources, uh, compile those and build these platforms for communities. So I, I mentioned earlier that we're doing this work for Community Board 9. Uh, these are customizable maps that contain information with regards to the parcels within their geographic boundaries. Uh, instead of creating archive documents, we're creating living documents that they can, we train them to sort of access um, and then be able to uh, uh, basically program the site that it would actually retrieve the data and update some of the data points about some of the, um, some of the properties within that, uh, within that geographic territory. So what you're seeing right here is just a quick uh, sort of tutorial animation for Community Board 9 members. This is specifically the uh, Land Use and Housing Committee uh, on how to particularly use this tool and then also to flush out what other aspects of the tool that we're not able to provide them could they use in the future. Uh, and what we're trying to imagine is that communities need to understand the territories that they reside in are assets. And they should think of them as such and figure out how to manage those assets uh, for better returns and better equitable uh, usage of that territory. And so here's another uh, uh, map that's canvassing opportunity zones. Um, very complex, no regulations around opportunity zones for those who understand, no tax revenue coming back into that community. Uh, this is to, one, identify where those sites are. Secondly, to give a report on those lots, which is public information. Uh, and then it's up to them, it's up to the community to figure out how they will engage uh, these developers one-to-one uh, -one because they have that right to inquire what might be coming how could they participate and perhaps uh, leverage the information, again, democratizing the data that they can gather uh, to speak more uh, directly about uh, the future of some of those sites. And I see we are on zero, zero, zero. So I'm gonna take you towards the end uh, quickly. So um, just another important point, displacement is very, very real. Despite all of the construction in New York City, uh, these particular uh, neighborhoods throughout New York uh, had an, uh, out, uh, very high numbers of total buildings with decreases in units. This is the number of buildings with the lower graph. So Central Harlem, which is where uh, Community Board 9 is, 112 buildings exhibited lost count in units. Uh, that total unit loss was 831 units of housing. And this is due to renovation, uh, combining of units, landowners, uh, property owners, moving people out, displacing them, and converting these units over. So in addition to the housing shortage that we already have, uh, there is also housing that needs to be replaced. Moving forward, we thought we would look, um, again, learning that there were height value correlations uh, to properties throughout New York, we started to compare geographically uh, Midtown to Central Harlem. And in doing so, uh, to no surprise, there were correlations between the property values um, that had taller heights 
uh, versus those who had lower heights and clearly downturn versus, versus uptown, uh, where there is an enormous amount of affordable housing in central Harlem. So the numbers are something like 350 and change versus 145 in terms of uh, height discrepancies um, that uh, allowed us to sort of uh, illustrate to some of our partners uh, that included uh, local city council members, uh, the Housing and Land Use Committee of some of the community boards to kind of get an understanding of what was potentially at stake uh, with regards to kind of understanding some of this data. Right. So to kind of wrap up, so what we thought we would do just, uh, again, through lots of conversations with uh, uh, community political representatives, uh, the Land Use and Housing Committee of Community Boards, uh, a number of the economists that were working on our team, um, some of the uh, social scientists who were documenting the history and transformation of cities, um, allowed us to kind of look at this zoning issue and see if we could think of new rezoning or new zoning categories that the city of New York could consider that would allow perhaps this uh, notion of um, increasing housing specifically for affordable housing developers. So incentivizing the private market to, ha to participate, uh, overcome the number one impediment of land costs, and perhaps uh, add significantly at scale uh, to the number of units that might become available um, on the island of Manhattan and Central Harlem in particular. So what we discovered, this is for West Harlem Community Board 9, uh, the average existing built residential buildings had an FAR of 3.4. Uh, the allowable was 4.2. There was a difference of 0.8. That 0.8 difference in that district equates 45,000 uh, new residential units. That was at an average of, I think, 650 square feet. Um, dispersed over 2,600 uh, uh, identified residential buildings in that district. Uh, the average height of those buildings is 4.5 stories, uh, tenement-like structures uh, built in very specific times. So they're all, they're all quite common and, and very familiar to those uh, living, residing in that area. The sample case visualization that I'm going to show you right now, and this is where I'll wrap up, um, needed to provide a kind of visual uh, sort of provocation to our audience, which includes politicians, community members, community residents, to kind of understand what that would mean. And so what you're looking at is the kind of existing condition first, which is there. That is the, the, the landscape of Community Board 9. 80% of those buildings we distributed that additional FAR that was allowable over 80% of the residential structures. And then we wrote the script that it would randomly disperse uh, three to four stories, I'm sorry, three stories at a smaller percentage and then four stories again, so that's what you're seeing in the next iteration. And this was to kind of provoke this notion that the zoning was produced, producing this artificial scarcity that was also producing an imbalance in terms of how the affordable housing developers could participate and make their balance sheets um, and their um, performers actually compete in a market and borrow the kind of premise from the super talls to see if we can exploit the policy to see if that was possible. So I'll end there. Thank you. I will try to ask um, a, a few short questions and then open it up to the audience. As moderator, I get the uh, priority, which is great. I have three. Um, in terms of just trying to link the, the perspectives, obviously we're, this is, these are four individuals coming from very different um, points of view. Um, but I think each of them were addressing policies, practices, design approaches to some degree um, that address structural inequality and the impact, impacts and future impacts of climate change. Um, I'm going to sort of go back to the original question, so I gave you a little um, hint as to where I was going to head. But um, someone earlier has talked about trauma and why no one's brought up trauma and our alienation from the earth. Um, and I, you know, I, this brings me back to that question that I referred to as I was talking a little bit about Naomi Klein's work and her, um, th her belief in the incompatibility of, of capitalism and climate. Um, and I really, I wanted to understand if 
our panelists think we can work within free market ideologies and if that could lead to the kind of change necessary for survival or is that too incremental? And then before you answer it, I mean, I just want to give a little context. I mean, generationally, our students are less interested in sort of seeming to be less interested in working within pre-existing frameworks and more interested in sort of dismantling outdated structures of power. And, and so I, I wanted to understand if we're not thinking big enough or we think that we could actually arrive in where we, we hope to um, with the kind of work that each one of you are doing. As a, as a member of the millennial generation who gets spoken about often as, as, as being a part of these change agents, um, I would say I showed up with these big ideas of trying to make change happen from within the system, and I fight every day to try to put basic numbers on the pro forma spreadsheet to say, we have agency in making these changes happen. You know, If you engage in these resiliency and design strategies around sustainability, then you will help us to make better buildings and this will go better for all of us and this will make a good, good, good climate change aware society. Um, as I go through that, I, am, I feel like, I've, like a big glass ceiling is on my face. Um, <laughs> Because when I show up to tell these, tell these things to some of the big institutional banks, they say, I don't believe you. And I say, well, what about the 42 other studies that, that say that these numbers exist and that actually you're going to lose money if you don't engage in these strategies? Um, and they say, well, we need more evidence. So, <laughs> um, so my, my end conclusion is that yes and no. So I won't give up the fight. And I won't give up the conversation. I won't give up the research. I won't give up what we're doing. I believe in it, and I think it's really important. I think our generation will be a part of that change. But I am very concerned about the existing generation's adaptability and ability to listen to uh, the stories that they asked for. They asked for these stories. We gave them these stories, and they're not listening. Well, I, th I think I. Um in describing how we were working and who we work with. Um, so government, industry, um, the civic, um, and academia, I, th I think it sort of uh, starts to answer that we are trying to work within the system, or maybe sort of restructure how the system operates and, and where it gets its incentives and ideas from. Um, I would also say that, you know, in some of the work that we're doing, um, particularly in New York, uh, where impact is most felt uh, at scale. We, we believe that we should be uh, adopting an approach that is scalable and immediately transferable. Right? And, and therefore, um, these are not sort of one-off ideas. We really want to attack zoning um, as the culprit. We're not pointing fingers at, at the market, but we understand that the market is not visionary and, and, it's, and by nature is risk averse. And so if we could produce uh, some evidence that um, begins to level the equitable playing field even within development, so perhaps what we're doing is, is not immediately uh, engaged fully and solely with the community, but there are some uh, very good developers out there doing really good work whose portfolios are, are having a hard time competing in this market. Um, and they don't want to do luxury. They want to stay where they are, but it's, in getting, it's getting increasingly uh, difficult to compete. And so if you uh, imagine what's the barrier, mm -hmm. and we recognize it to be land value or the cost of the land, these existing affordable buildings, uh, they exist already, right? They're, they're, their land is tied to a mortgage that's ideally being paid down. We're not, we're not looking for full transparency on what those books look like, but we, we have gotten reports back that an infusion of opportunity to build on top of these things um, beyond the scale of the point eight, actually, which is what the argument we're trying to make, uh, we fondly call it uh, Mansard New York, right? Because New York City buildings don't have mansards. And so if you travel the world, uh, other uh, developed countries, there's a, a, a fairly sizable chunk of real estate uh, aesthetically and programmatically positioned on top of these buildings. New York doesn't have those. We have these flat roofs that underperform, uh, and there's an artificial cap. There's this kind of scarcity there, and we don't understand from an academic perspective what's the logic. Why, why would we not allow uh, a particular incentive uh, built out for um, a part of the market that is doing good, uh, and can we help as, and I'm trained as an architect and have some data science background, 
Um, can we facilitate um, from where we sit a conversation uh, that would actually provoke some, some meaningful and scalable change? So I, I, I really appreciated your presentations and as part of the academic sort of platform. And uh, I think um, Dean Curry and USC setting itself up for uh, sort of a, 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 a tremendous opportunity to actually provide these kinds of sort of professional skills and academic skills to arm the professional community. Um, I will speak for myself, certainly in terms of landscape architecture, it's a lonely battle and I'm, I'm a, basically a fighter. And I'm too much trouble sometimes, I don't know, the, one of the, there's, there's a community, um, a sort of an elected leader here, but really um, at some point um, we do, I, I was just at SPUR, which is a, a really interesting organization up in the Bay Area, and we need to find, certainly in our region, we need to find a way of really coming together, helping to sort of parse out the issues and really do the research and give us the, what is it, what are we? So do you know what an atmospheric river is? No. Okay, well, it doesn't matter, but I learned, a <laughs> new, I, know, I learned about your profession today, what was it? Econometrician. So we, we need econometricians to be doing the kind of work, um, and, and I'll, I'll like let you, and, uh, yeah, right, like exactly, that. atmospheric <laughs> rivers, huh? But in any event, I think that uh, what's exciting about today, although be it a little depressing, because landscape architecture and public realm and the environment wasn't mentioned enough in the way that I think we should mention, because biophilia matters, by the way, um, it, that that I think we're you're 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 positioning yourselves um, as um, academic institutions to really help bolster and create a framework for these conversations to take on um, a, you know a tremendous uh, sort of uh, you know sort of to catap and to allow us to catapult to another level of understanding and uh, to find solutions. So I'm being a little sensitive because I went over and I needed to be moderated. Um, I apologize. I but to apologize. answer your, uh, no, it was fair moderation. Um, I think that uh, we, we need to recognize that in, in California, in a way California is a, a model of successful um, operation of, a, of, of democracy. It's, um, it's a state where the, um, the developers don't decide uh, what the building how the building performs in terms of energy efficiency. We have uh, Title 24, which is an energy efficiency code. Uh, that was done through a political process. We have, uh, I wanted to bring up Senator Kevin DeLeon because he represents a district, one of the districts on the Cal Enviro screen that's one of the most impacted uh, areas of, of California. And he was, uh, he decided, he was elected, he decided to write a Senate bill to get California off of fossil fuels, and that bill passed, and now we have targets, and California's on track to decarbonize its energy supply. Um, we can talk about the cap and trade program. That's, in a way, trying to um, undo some of the uh, environmental harms that uh, are the, you know, the outcome of a, a legacy of sort of environmental racism in, in California. Um, that's a, a, a political effort to achieve that. I think. Um, the, the, the focus, I think, is participation. If we're training architects, uh, we need to train them to participate in the systems and processes of making buildings that can achieve these goals. And I think that that is, um, in a way, we're seeing that happening in California. Uh, and so there are, there are models, I think, that, that can be sort of translated and, and applied. If it's, it's a state where the power companies don't decide how much electricity they produce. There's actually a California Energy Commission tells them uh, how much they can produce. So um, it is a free market economy, but it's regulated. And um, buildings are regulated. And we can, instead of just being sort of reactive to sort of existing systems and processes of, of, of making buildings, uh, architects can, one, you know, understand them and come to the table with, with sort of answers and, and propose, you know, innovative solutions. 
but they can also start to try and envision um, improvements or refinements to those processes and then have those um, uh, developed through uh, a political structure. And, and landscape architects matter too. You know, performative landscapes matter. Otherwise, you're not going to you're not going to have buildings that are going to perform. So, Mia, I, can, may, may I? Yes. So, I, two minutes. I, this is so I, I opened um, my my talk with regards to these these yes. Um, yes. Uh, hyper objects and yes. and landscapes, industrial agricultural landscapes in particular. If, if you've ever seen um, satellite footage of these, the imagery there you wouldn't know what you were looking at. And, and this, this is our, our land, this is the United States, this is Europe. Um, and so my question to you with regards to, to landscape architecture, um, and I feel humbled because I look at these images and I, and I have no idea how to proceed. Right? So my, whatever expertise that I imagine I have with regards to understanding the environment goes away. <laughs> and, and so you know, I, I pose the question to you as a landscape architect, those perplexing environments, uh -huh. performative or not, do we, do we really know about remediation or is the scenario so sort of loaded with variables that we just don't know that we're still basically grasping for straws? I think we know a lot um, and I, I think uh, it, it's it's a longer conversation than two minutes. I'm going to behave. Uh, we're going to make the landscape architects better behaved part of the team here. No, no, uh, we be and you have the right team <laughs> No, I mean uh, I think we know a lot, and we need to know a lot more. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I think institutions like this and like like USC, actually Caltech and JPL are doing tremendous work. And uh, we just, you know, need, I think that there's a lot to look forward to. Okay, I'm sorry that we're gonna have to um, wrap this up. I, I just, you know, I, I think that there's opportunity after to obviously approach our panelists. I, I did wanna say that I'm really happy that the Cal Enviro screen mapping came up <laughs> and sort of issues of environmental justice um, in terms of risk and vulnerability. And I'm, I'm so curious how that environmental justice can become more um, mm -hmm. integral to our conversations about architectural production. It is very integral to landscape architectural production, mm -hmm. but in terms of architecture, I mean, I was a little bit frightened when I saw Lorcan or Hurley's rendering of the SROs or the equivalent in between the, the two freeways. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and he talked about the um, public space as being a filter for the contaminants in the air, but still just the situation in, at that intersection, just I mean, it, it's something that just needs to be addressed, and and I, I appreciate that it came up in a multiple, in all almost all of the instances of every panelist. So thank you. Um, so I think we're moving on. I, let's please give a round of applause for the panelists. Uh, I feel very uh, energized by um, the conversations, but also the stamina of of the audience. Um, you know, when, when Jeff, uh, myself, and Grace, and other faculty um, started putting this together, um, you know, you never know if anybody's going to come. Uh, so it's great that, that most, that many of you um, stayed a while and that we have a, a good group of students here who were here part of the day as well. Um, maybe a, just a round of applause for all of our panelists and all of our participants and moderators. Um, like many of the issues that, that were discussed, I don't think um, change happens overnight. And I think um, I'm so grateful for the faculty um, that we have at the school who uh, are brilliantly incorporating many of these ideas and innovations into their teaching, into their research. Um, but today we've also expanded our network and continue to expand our network of collaborators potential uh, partners, um, people that we can continue to converse with and have intellectual debates with as we as a school, as we as um, a culture um, begin to absorb um, the talent and the, and the discussions that we've, that we've witnessed today into our teaching, into our research, and into the culture of the school. 
Um, so I'm very excited and energized by that and look forward to um, all the work that that will um, entail and um, look forward to continuing uh, to have forums where we can, we can discuss this um, a little bit maybe outside of our classrooms, outside of faculty meetings, but um, to establish um, that, that discourse um, that will advance, continue to advance the work of our faculty in our school. So thank you very much. Um, really appreciate it and look forward to um, having all of you who aren't regularly on campus um, back for all of our events and uh, lectures. And I also just want to um, say a special thanks to Adele Chang, who's a member of our Board of Counselors, who's here. Adele. And again to Ned and Nancy Fox, who helped support this forum, who are also, uh, Ned Fox is also on our Board of Counselors. So thank you very much, and um, have a great evening. Thanks.